be a child on earth. Yes, Mr. Auburn. Lord and Lady, uh, what I would like to do in time I have... Just wait, wait while Mr. Drabble gets fully yes, aware of it. Yes, I apologise for not being properly dressed. <laughs> We've all done <laughs> it. I should be good either. It is much better than to stand Thank up you. rather than trying to do it sitting down. You just got the judicial road. Much harder. Go on, Start again. Yes, Mr. Orban. Uh, Lord and Lady, what I would like to do this morning uh, is five things. One, on construction, give you two points and also answer any questions you may have thought of overnight, um, <laughs> which is the real point of touching on it, uh, as well as hand up a document which uh, my learned friend Miss Clement has helpfully drawn to, to my attention, which may, may, you may or may not find of use. Um, secondly, uh, Mr Drabble's lists. He's given you some very helpful lists in paragraph 36 and, and orally. He gave you a seven point list. I want to touch on those so you at least know my broad response to his lists. Um, thirdly, uh, to uh, go to the grounds, which is really largely following the skeleton. I don't think it's moved on greatly in that respect, other than one point, which is my point number four, as I go through the, the skeleton grounds, um, I'll specifically engage with the reasons Mr. Drabble says uh, this case is different from RET, because it's important to go to that directly. Um, and then fifthly and lastly, um, if there's time and if you think it would assist you, to very briefly touch on uh, what Ms. Kavanagh has said yesterday about secure accommodation, which may or may not be an issue which you were contemplating dealing with. Um, so then the first thing which uh, I said to go to is construction. So I've got two points on that and uh, to, to give you a document. The first point on construction is what is the end point of what I'm saying on construction? And that is in our skeleton, which you'll find the relevant part in core bundle, page five, so C5 of the core bundle. So it's core bundle C to Charlie 5, paragraph 19. And uh, 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 I'll leave you to see paragraph 19. The, the end point there is um, section 3 of the HRA, where necessary, uh, to deal with the issue, the, the, the weather. Um, and a similar point is made at the very end of the skeleton, paragraph 60, where we say we expressly acknowledge that um, uh, 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 human rights act is, is needed uh, and we did do below as well um, and you can see that express acknowledgement of that issue in Mr Justice McDonald's judgement you may have already noted it if you want the reference it's in the authorities bundle at B B for Bertie uh, Five, I think it is. So that's the core bundle then. Oh, sorry, core yeah. bundle, yeah. thank you, yes. I picked up the wrong bundle. B5. Paragraph 4. So, core bundle, B5. Paragraph 4, and the last four lines of that paragraph says, finally, Secretary of State concedes where it's necessary to place a child in a particular place to prevent a breach of that child out of two three rights, local authority has power, and that power may be a duty to place the child there. And that, that reflects what we're saying about Section 3 of the HRA, that if it's necessary to avoid a <coughs> breach of power, comes a duty. So we're uh, very upfront with that. Um, on that, uh, I make two short points. Um, one, what that means 
is a, a section 3 HRA reading in and our view, the state's view is that would be a reading in if necessary to section 22 capital C, 6 small c I don't want to run after my feet, but it's effectively, in short, in short, along the lines of registered children's home or the thing in re-t. I'm deliberately being non-exact there with the concept in re-t. And we know that concept in re-t, or the re-t principle, if I can call it that, is circumstances of imperative necessity where required to avoid a breach of article 2 or 3, in unregistered children's home for a short period while obtaining registration and in accordance with the President's guidance. And I'm happy to repeat those points if I've gone too fast, but um, the, the, the only point in saying that is really just to summarise what I think the principle for RETA is, doing, doing all of that. Really. Um, and that, that's effectively what, if an implication is needed for Section 3 of the HRA, that's what it is. It's the wording of small c, registered children's home, or the re principle. Um, that's the first consequential point. The, the second consequential point on, on, on this the end point is to go back to a point which Lord Justice Baker raised <laughs> yesterday about whether the Appellant's case brings us to the same result or not. And I think there may have been some, uh, some, some views expressed on that, and it, it may be that at, at some stage your lordships were attracted to the suggestion that the consequence of the appellant's argument is to achieve some narrowing of the scope uh, of what we're talking about here. Um, we don't agree with that necessarily, that uh, the end point, I can call it that, isn't anything different from what we have in re The exceptional or implication or whatever terminology you wish to use is driven by the things that drove the outcome of re including the necessity Imperial necessity, the avoidance of HRA breach, Article 2.3, um, <coughs> and so on, as I just described. And uh, those are the things that lead to the result. So it's not a tightening, it's the same result as re -T. And in answer to the question uh, which Lord Justice Baker raised yesterday, we would say the outcome is actually the same, the end point is the same. I hope that makes yes. sense, or there's nothing, con well, what I'm really saying is if there's anything consequential on that, <laughs> happy to address it. Um, that's the first point on construction. I said there were two points on construction. The, the second one, which is related but, 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 but slightly separate, is um, the consequence of this CD point, small c, small d point, if I can put it that way. And that, uh, I, I take you to our skeleton, paragraph 51, 52, which is core bundle, C for Charlie, 13. What, what paragraph? Yes, um, it's dealt with at 51, 52. I'd like to read from 52, which is effectively the, the nub of it. So C for Charlie 13, 52, if an unregistered children's home, not within D, uh, then 27A, which is only addresses placements on D, is not relevant, reflects the distinction between unregistered and unregulated. Um, the Secretary of State raised the point below, uh, but Mr. St. John did not uh, decide the issue. Now, so what we say, consequence of this engagement with the issue of small c, small d, is an unregistered children's home. There's this setting that is 
in fact operating as children's home but is not registered, um, we say that that's not actually properly described as within other arrangements for all the explanation I was giving yesterday. Um, and what that leads to is the appeal before you is about other arrangements and the, 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 the construction or, or the, the... Sorry, you said it's not an other arrangement within D. Yes. And then you said it's therefore the appeal is about other arrangements. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm I'll, 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 I'll start the sentence again. Um, um, an unregistered children's home is a home, and, and now I'm, I'm simply seeing to summarise what I was saying yesterday afternoon. An unregistered children's home is a, is, is a setting that is in, in fact meeting the criteria of small c, so should be registered, but is not. That properly characterised, as I was seeking back point yesterday, is one to be analysed as a failing to meet the requirements of c. So therefore, it's not in D. Yes. 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 That, that, that was the point I was thinking. And your position is that's all. Is that right? Has always been the case. Yes. Although local authorities may have had a different interpretation. Yes. And does the amendment clarify that? The amendment sought to um, effectively stop that practice, which local authorities have been engaging in, which is what I. Take you to in the document I, I said I was going to hand up which my own friends helped me draw my attention to. Um, it, it might be simplest as I've mentioned it to just hand it up now. I've, I've handed it to my own friends. This is the government's consultation response on the uh, on, on what led to the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm grateful to Ms. Clement for drawing attention to this. Thank you. Um, the relevant part <laughs> is really pages. Uh, hopefully, you've got the same pagination I have. It's always worth checking because I printed off. Well, we'll find out. Uh, pages 9 to 11. Yes, it is the same pagination. Pages 9 to 11. And. Uh, it says government will ban the placement of children under 16 in fencing and in fencing, and that really uh, is intended to be as as Lord Justice Baker summarised back to me my own submissions yesterday about what was intended to stop a practice that it appears. It Does this clarify it in terms? Is that what was happening? I'll take you to, yes, page 10. Um, in the, uh, under the, well, between the first and second bullet point, the second last paragraph, we do not believe, we do not believe placing children under the age of 16 in settings that are simply not equipped to meet their needs or keep them safe should there be an option. Um, providing care for a complex range of needs for young children is not the purpose of independent and semi-independent semi provision. Uh, and, and that reflects what I say about it. it was never the government's intention that children that needed that high level of care would be dealt with under a mechanism that was intended for lower levels of care, independent, semi-independent. Um, these settings cannot legally do this without carrying registration as a children's home. This leads to a scenario where providers must either operate outside the legal framework, operating an illegal, unregistered children's home in order to meet the needs of a child with complex needs, or simply not meet their needs at all, neither of which are acceptable outcomes. This is why we're moving to ban this practice. So that, that is uh, what the government intended in any event. Um, it was to uh, put a stop. So why, why does it say that they're operate, operating outside the legal framework if they're operating an unregistered children's home? You, <coughs> you, your submission was that these are regulated and fall within the territory, at least, of C. So why, why is that outside the legal framework? Well, because they, they, they're not registered. It's not so. It, so it is regulated, but it's not registered. Yes, yes. I, I think that sentence doesn't have the exact reflection of what we've been discussing be, between that. But it, it's 
within the territory of something that should that is regulated. It's a regulated sector, but it hasn't been registered. So operating in legal unregistered children or something. So hasn't met the requirements of C in that. This was February of last year. Yes. Response. Yes. This is the, 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 the well, this year, sorry. This I'm year. Sorry. This year. The consultation <laughs> response. I've lost a sense of time. No. <laughs> we, we, all, we, all, we all have after a year and a half. Okay. Um, but, but post this court's decision in Reed Team, but pre the Supreme Court. Yes. No. no. Yes, you're right. I'm happy for you to convey the date and the timing of it. My Lord, the, the hearing in the Supreme Court was in October 2020. Yes. I was then acted for the Secretary of State and told the Supreme Court there was a consultation, an outstanding consultation on the banning of unregulated placements. The Supreme Court came back and asked for more written submissions yeah. in May when the Secretary of State told the Supreme Court we have made the regulations in February of 2021 which banned the use of unregulated accommodation for those under the age of 16. Then the Supreme Court's judgment is in July of 2021, yes. and these regulations came into force yeah. in September. Yes, thank yeah. you. My, my question was directed at what did the, the department have in mind when it drafted this response? And obviously it, it would have known of the Court of Appeals decision in RET, but not the Supreme Court's. Obviously. Yes, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that clarification. The there is a recognition in the document of the difference between unregistered and unregulated, because on page 11, the last paragraph, a penultimate sentence, does talk about unregulated provision. Yes, that that's in, does does refer to unregulated provision. And the, the aim was whether uh, this is provision, I think, context of what we're talking about, which is not a children's home, mm. but in some way it's providing some accommodation for a young person under 16. It's very hard to understand what that would be if it's not a children's home. Would it be the semi-independent... The, I mean, the, mm. a, as an example, in um, 27A1 Roman 4, I think it is, there's schools, uh, yeah, I can't remember the wording of this. Yes, yes. Um, mm. uh, and what that can be um, is if uh, I haven't got to hand the, the precise statute of provisions, that if, um, I think, the, the, well, the way the system reg regulation works is. Uh, um, a, a school providing accommodation for more than a certain number of days a year, I think it's 295 days a year, yeah. um, has to be registered as a children's home. Yeah. But if it's less than that, then they don't need to register as a children's home. So you could have, say, a term time only residential setting, yeah. Yeah. which doesn't meet the threshold of mm. providing care and therefore being registered as a children's home. Going back to the paragraph on page 10 that you took us to, this would tend to support Mr. Drabble's argument, wouldn't it? it? It indicates that the ban is aimed at stopping um, unregistered placement in an unregistered children's home. Well, um, Whereas your, your submission is the ban doesn't impact on unregistered children's homes, provided that they're unregistered within the RET context for a short period. Uh, during which compliance with the President's guidance is undertaken. It, it, it doesn't affect that, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and and but why, event, why isn't this paragraph an indication in support of Mr. Drabble's submission, uh, which is that the ban does impact on unregistered children's homes and you no longer can place in an unregistered children's home? Well, uh, you say that... Um, Unregistered children's homes were already caught by 22 capital C 6 C, which is the requirement that children's homes are well, would, for the children's home option need to be registered, and that that's why it refers to um, operating legal unregistered children's homes. 
but it's an illegal unregistered children's home, even if in seven days' time it'll get registration. Yes. At the moment where you're looking at it and looking at detaining a child in it, that's it. That's an illegal unregistered children's home. Yes. And this paragraph says we're moving to ban it. Yes. Practice. That, yes, that's right. And that well, but uh, I understand that that language, but it, we, we say what the amendment was doing was uh, regularising what the Secretary of State thought was always the intention of the provision of the scheme, which is C covers children's homes and requires registration. Local authorities had been using that in a different way and the Secretary wanted to put a stop to that. And you, but you, that wasn't you're, I, think, that I think you're entitled to <coughs> say that this document written before RE-T doesn't obviously include the gloss that RE-T um, legitimises yes. in terms of having for a short time uh, unregistered children's homes um, acceptable, yes. uh, provided they're seeking to comply with the President's guidance. Yes, that's right. Does the, the President's guidance, I had to remind myself of the date, is actually November, is it right, it's November 2019? 19, yeah. Which is, I was thinking it was 2020, but it shows how... No, it's not 19. So, it was um, amended. It was a, there, there, was a, there was an addendum. Addendum, that's right. Which I think, I can't remember the date, but I think it was about a year later, yeah. 20, 2020, December 2020. Is there a reference to the guidance in the consultation response? Um, I'm not sure I could uh, I can answer that off the top of my head. Um, I've only Ms. Clement is shaking her head tentatively. Uh, um, anyway, yeah. Don't, yeah. Um, and so to finish off the second point, I said there were two points on construction. I've taken you to the document. The second point on construction, on the consequence of the small c, small d, um, uh, applying that to the present case, why do we say that the current placement we said with, um, it should be registered as a children's home? And that, that is in our skeleton, paragraph 13, 14, which is uh, poor bundle, uh, C for Charlie. <clears throat> Children placed under a deprivation liberty must in all likelihood be receiving care. That's a point that's made in the President's guidance and also um, made in Judgment Field and Henry T. And the, the simple point on that is if a child is uh, in such condition that they require a deprivation of liberty. It's hard to see a situation in which a child could be deprived of the liberty, one element of that being constant supervision and control, yet not receiving care. But it's really impossible to understand how that would be. I, I cannot yeah. see. No, you say it's, it's hard, hard to think of a Venn diagram. See, but it, it's, in, it's, it's intensive care, isn't it? In, yes. yes, much more than just yeah. care. It's a very high level of care indeed. Um, so uh, I think it must, must be they're receiving care and uh, therefore they must fall within the, the, the establishment must be providing care, otherwise something very worrying is happening indeed. Um, so it must fall within the definition of children's home, whether it's registered or not, which, which is that point. That was the first overall point, the, the, the construction point. The second thing I said I would do is to engage with Mr. Rebel's lists. Again, I, I, I'm in the court as to uh, how <coughs> Father would wish me to go into that, but I, I can, if it would assist, run through Mr. Rebel's paragraph 36 and run through his seven point oral list. If that would assist, it may be that we've already covered the territory. And well, we had a run at that last night, didn't we, with my Lord, Lord Justice Baker yes. took you. So if you want to revisit that, then please do. Well, if I can perhaps just touch on the, the, the paragraph 36 points briefly. Um, I, I, 
think it might start to get repetitive <coughs> if I go through the, the oral seven points because there's a lot of trauma therapy there. Um, so uh, then to, uh, to run through um, Mr. Drabble, at least the, the, the first few, at least of Mr. Drabble's paragraph 36 points, A, he says, close list, and we agree with that. Um, of course, we have to be careful about terminology, make sure we're talking about the same thing. Um, uh, that, uh, but, but how can you be talking about a closed list where you've got these other settings that are on their way to registration? Well, aren't aren't on the list. directly on the list. You say they're in the territory of the list. So how, I just they only get there through the mechanism of what I call the RE-T principle. I know, but then it's mm. not a closed mm. list. Well, well <laughs> I'm very grateful for you pointing that out. I mean, closed list in the sense that C conveys the statutory options. To the extent that we go beyond those, we do so by the mechanism of RE-T. So it's a closed list at, that can only be expanded under RE-T. And Human Rights Act, Section 3. Yes. Subject to re-T and the reading in from HRA section three, which carries with it the narrowness of what that principle is. Um, the second or, or point B in, in Mr. Treble's paragraph thirty-six is it says unregistered children's homes. Um, cannot fall within 6C, well, now I might start to be repeating myself, but I think the answer probably is not quite. It's how I described yesterday it falls to be considered by 6C and registration is missing and we know what follows from that. This all follows from your, your observations about A, doesn't it? About whether or not it's a closed list and the, the exchange you just had with the... Yeah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, what, what, what I call the Reedy principle, you could also I call that. The court wasn't entirely clear last night whether you were saying it was a closed list or not. But I think I think you've now clarified what uh, you were saying. I, I'm grateful for the assistance in <laughs> being able to clarify that. Um, and then 36C, it said that all other classes of accommodation mm -hmm. not within A, B or C must fall within D. Um, we say, well, no, that would undermine what A, B, and C are, and particularly the requirement of registration, but also any strictures in A and B as well. Subject, of course, to the principle which we've referred to before, and Mrs. Mrs. Susses, they get similar as um, pointed well, out. Well, would it undermine it? Because now, it might have undermined it under the old Regulation 27. But Mr. Drabble's point is, under the new Regulation 27A regime, there's no undermining because you've either got to get your registration to be in C, or whatever other requirements there are for A and B, and if you fall outside C, you're into D, and then you're you're simply not in the in the territory of the legislation. You're not you're not capable of providing a a setting within the legislation unless you fall in the closed list that is set out in Regulation 27A. We say that um, the only way you can get within the children's home category is by registration and if you haven't got registration you then fall into that OT principle and that carries with it the very strictures and narrowness which we know of. And it's those strictures and narrowness which would be, which, which may be a threat if you just if you said, well, we're not talking about C, we're talking about D. It's keeping those constraints, those narrow constraints from presence, guidance, and so on. But I don't see why it would undermine, why it undermines the scheme if something that isn't in A to C is therefore an other arrangement in D. Because the requirement of registration is important and uh, the only mechanism for overcoming that requirement of registration is a very short-term temporary mechanism of uh, what is absolutely necessary. But sorry, you're not. I, I'm not. It, maybe I'm not explaining myself very well. But 
If you're not in C because you're not registered on Mr. Drabble's argument, you're an other arrangement, you're in D therefore, but you, you can't get, get home through D because you then go into 27A and you're not covered and therefore you're forced back into C, but you have to get registered. So it's not undermining the scheme. I, I can see you've got a different approach to it, but I'm just quibbling with you saying it undermines the scheme. Actually, as on one view, it strengthens the scheme. If all that's said is that if you can't come in C because you're not registered, you then look to D, and D doesn't give you a route home yeah. because nothing in there, so you have yeah. to go back to C. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that is different <laughs> to what I'm saying. We're saying that it is properly characterised as C. D, it's not D. Right. Um, Maybe it isn't different. Because, well, I mean, we say yeah. that, that because that's what C is intended for. It's intended for children's home. I mean, you could also make the point that D doesn't give any answer. Um, but uh, I mean, well, to that extent, if that's all that's said, well, that's not inconsistent with what I'm saying, which yeah. is that it's a, it's a matter. I've, I've used the phrase in the territory. It's a, a deliberately non Mr. Mr. Drabble's C depends on hit on the answer to B. These aren't, as it were, separate. These are a chain of submissions of assertions. So he says an unregistered children's home can't fall within C. You say it can, in which I'm going to read to interpretation. Yes. So yes. You, given that you don't agree about B, you've already diverted his B. So we're going to, you don't agree at C. We the don't premise of his C is one you don't share. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. You've answered. Right to... I mean, if we stare up. If we just looked at C by itself, can you identify a class of accommodation which doesn't fall within A to C, but does fall with, but does not fall within D? Isn't it right that, on your interpretation of A to C, his assertion in thirty six C is correct? If it doesn't fall within A to C. It has to fall within D. That's why you tightened it up. Well, read on its own According without to B. Consultation response, which you read, just... read on its own without B. Yes, but the point is that it's it, the thirty-six B point. We say properly interpreted, it should be considered as a matter of compliance or non-compliance with twenty-two capital C six small C. Once we, once you divert, diverged at B, the rest of this you're, you're going to carry on disagreeing. Yes. I expect, because yes. And you, your answer to all of this is that that's, um, this is a clear and tight reliance on the black letter of the regulations. And your answer to the whole appeal is that the Supreme Court has already decided that outside that, it's acceptable because of Section Three of the Human Rights Act to have unregistered children's homes for a time where there's a a pressing need, or whatever the yes. phrase might be. Yes. And so, yes. in the nature of the nature of it's the, it's irrelevant what this says because that's always going to be on your case the exception. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Um, I, I I think in view of that and 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 that this this court is bound by that, um, because the Supreme Court have determined it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, I think in view of that, I, I can probably in the. Paragraph 36 analysis there, unless there's any particular part of paragraph 36 you wish me to address. Um, then the third point I say to cover is the the grounds which largely follow the skeleton might have significantly moved on from what's in the skeleton. I can deal with relatively briefly as well as turning up certain documents. Um, so we we, express, we accept the principle of the compliance with Article 5. Uh, requires a condition of conformity um, to uh, substantive and procedural rules of national law. As a, as a starting point, we accept that. And uh, as you know, our case is in using the inherent jurisdiction. What the court is authorising is the deprivation or detention rather than placement. And that the authorisation of deprivation or detention is in accordance with law, namely the common law. And to the extent that it's said that there are legal issues arising with the placement, whether it's registration or, or other, um, that is about the legality of the placement rather than the legality of the detention. 
Can, can I just ask you about that? Mm. If you um, are contemplating, for example, extradition to, um, which would result in detention of the subject, say, in a prison in Hungary, where prison conditions are so dire as to breach Article 3 and potentially Article 8, but 3 probably, would that detention, would, would the court sanction, would the UK court sanction that extradition decision? The, the detention, uh, there's no problem with authorising detention, but if it's <coughs> in conditions that breach a person's human rights because of the nature of the placement in prison or wherever it is. Isn't that bound up with the lawfulness of the detention? I might need to come back to you on the extradition point. I might need to think about that. Well, I'm, I'm not worried so much about it. I'm just using that as, yes. an, as a parallel, just to test how you can separate out the placement from the detention when the detention is so linked to the placement, as Mr. Drabble has explained. Yes, well, for that purpose, we, we go really back to re T and the distinctions drawn there. And that, that, that's what we rely on. Um, so we, we think the, the position hasn't moved on or is different to what the Supreme Court considered in, in, in that distinction. And if I can show you that, it might be that you're sufficiently familiar with, with the particular paragraphs of Reed T, but I'll, I'll at least draw them up. And uh, this is in Authorities Bundle. B forty two. The point I'm seeking to make here is what what was the issue in UT and what were the, the flaws or the, the, the legal issues which the inherent jurisdiction was faced with. And B forty two, this is Lady Black's at the bottom of the page, paragraph 15, you will see that um, at H, the principal reason advanced in support of the argument, and then there is Roman 1, 2, 3. Uh, Roman 2 is inherent jurisdiction must not be used in a way to cut across the statutory scheme. Is it, uh, an argument we also face in this appeal, and then over the page, Roman 3. Deprivation of liberty authorised under the inherent jurisdiction of the four files of Article 5. Um, uh, no knowledge of the private liberty saved in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law. So those were the arguments, or, or, or the, the, the grounds, um, which were, were put against the inherent jurisdiction there. And then if you go to B61, Again, in Lady Black's judgment, 89 to 91, talks about the, the, the argument uh, raised, 89, the main thrust of the, the argument in this court in relation to Article 5 is the use of inherent jurisdiction to authorise deprivation of liberty was not in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law, uh, ties in with Article 51D, uh, and then 90, Article 5 imposes an obligation to conform to the substantive and procedural rules of natural, national law. Accordingly, the detention must have a legal basis in domestic law, and the law must be of a quality which is compatible with the rule of law. This means where domestic law authorises deprivation, liberty must be sufficiently accessible, precise, perceivable, not arbitrary. Um, so that, that, that again, is um, the, a, of a similar nature as the argument we have in, in this court. And um, in a, a pause in paragraph 90, you see the second sentence, note, note the way Lady Black phrases it, the detention 
must have a, a base in domestic law. And then the next sentence that this means that where the domestic law authorises the deprivation of liberty, which is the, 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 the detention issue. So it's not talking about the place. And that's what the court's inherent jurisdiction is, is going to. And then just to finish off that, that, that passage, note 91, nothing in Article 5 or case law requires that domestic law procedures should be set out in statute regulations rather than being common law based. And obviously that's said with a view to the inherent jurisdiction being a creature of common law and cited authority, the standard authorities from Strasbourg about common law being within the corpus of what is considered um, having the quality of law in ECHR terms. And the, the arguments raised are then also repeated at 93 to 94. I won't uh, repeat those same points. What I would like to go to is um, B68. Is the, and you see the, the, the heading at the top of B68. Um, so Lady Black is summarising the, the issue of the argument she's dealing with here. The use of inherent jurisdiction in the present case was wrong because it cut across the statutory scheme and, and or use not in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law as required by Article 5. So there she's dealing with um, the same or very similar arguments to the ones raised in, in, in this appeal. And the point of taking you to this is to identify the legal issues or the, 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 the breaches or matters which were said to, to, to raise this problem. And those are summarised at 124 and 125. 124, appellant submits, two placements provided were provided for the purpose of restricting liberty and thus to secure accommodation. Um, so that was the first point. Uh, the secure accommodation and uh, uh, and therefore there, there was a failure to comply with the requirements of that. And then 125, she submits furthermore. So the second floor, if you like, uh, which is raised, is that both placements were children's homes. But not but placement one was not registered as such. And the person carry uh, and, and that meant that the person carrying on managing maybe was guilty of an offence problem of Regulation 3 uh, prohibits use of secure accommodation. Um, and then that led to 127, a balance of it's wrong in law to use inherent jurisdiction to authorise placement where that cuts across the statutory scheme. Inherent jurisdiction might not, must not be used to have effects. It's directed at those issues described in 124 and 125. And what we say is that you look at those things described one two four one two five. There isn't a material difference in principle between an issue of those natures there and what we're grappling with here. Where you have a placement operating in in, in fact as a children's home because it meets that statutory definition. It's providing care, accommodation, providing care without registration, needs to be registered. It is the same type of problem as that described in 125. Uh, at the very least, it's very similar to the problems in 124, 125. It's not, not, a, bit, not of a fundamental difference to what the court was, <coughs> what was based on. Which takes me to the, 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 my point number four, which the third cover, four or five, which is to engage with Mr. Drabble's reasons, which I, I've noted from his oral submissions, for distinguishing our case from RIT. Now, I'll, I'll just deal with those briefly and then finish off the submissions on the grounds. It's always dangerous when you're repeating someone else's submissions, but I've taken note of what I, what I believe he was saying on this, and of course I'll be corrected if I've misrecorded misunderstood any of the, the reasons he's given. But I've noted three, I think, he's raised. Um, one, he says the situation in the present case 
is one of ultraviaries or lack of power. Mm. And what we say about that is that actually the situation here is the same issue of use of a type of accommodation that requires registration without having that registration when that's when that's lacking. And that's exactly the issue which was discussed in Re T. Paragraph one two five. Indeed in a similar way, paragraph one two four as well. On a slightly different point. But it, it's not a different matter. It's simply described with different words, but it's the same issue. The second reason which I've identified in the oral submissions of speaking to distinguish this case from Re T is it's uh, is that there was a, a distinction which I believe was drawn as to who is allegedly in breach of the requirement. And I, and I think what was said is that Lord Stevens in Re T was contemplating a criminal offence by others, not by the local authority or not by the, and not by the court. So there's that. It was the provider who would be guilty of a criminal yes. offence, whereas mm. the use of the placement itself wouldn't be criminalised yes. or unlawful. Yes. Whereas, uh, whereas Mr. Mr. Drabble gets to make the submission you're dealing with now from a different route because he says this is re and this is little d territory yes. that we're in now, and the local authority are prohibited from making a placement that's in breach of little d. Well, you you've already made your submissions, which are that. Um, this case is not little d, it's little c, so you're never going, you're, you're, you're not in the same yes. part of the ballpark as Mr. Mr. Drabble yes. is on, on that point. Yes. <clears throat> I was make the further point, aside from that, when you read the Supreme Court's judgment uh, as a whole, the, 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 the majority judgments of Lady Black and Lord Stevens, it's quite clear that there is a wider principle underlying their judgment. And as an example, you'll, I'm, I'm sure, You'll have firmly in mind, um, paragraph 141 was the unthinkable that the High Court would not. That, 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 that paragraph, which I'm, I'm sure you've got ingrained in your minds. Um, unthinkable the High Court with a long established role of protecting children and, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> that, that, that's paragraph 141. That, there's clearly a broader basis, and that, run, that thinking runs through both the judgments of Lady Black and Lord Stevens. Um, and what follows from that is the question whether the legislative intent to oust the inherent jurisdiction in circumstances of necessity would turn on a distinction of the type raised now. And it, it clearly wouldn't. It's not uh, a, a principle so narrow as <laughs> sort of put. It would be a little odd to, uh, to have a legislative intent to oust the inherent jurisdiction that was there in the primary or surrounding the primary legislation by using secondary legislation. It would be an odd way of doing it. Yes. There's also just nothing you can point to to support that. I mean, this was also going through at the time of litigation around PT. If the minister had intended to somehow preempt the outcome and I don't know, preemptively reverse what might be decided in RET, well, you'd expect to see some hint somewhere, but absolutely not. Absolutely not. And uh, the third point to raise, and again, I struggle, forgive me if I've missed out any of his arguments or mischaracterised. But I'm just going from, from my note of what he said. Is the third point I think he seeks to distinguish re T is he relies on Lady Arden's judgment and says, well, you cannot use the inherent jurisdiction where a criminal offence will be committed. Uh, and I, I have him saying that we get the same answer as that from a lack of public law power. Um, I, I might repeating myself here, but we, we, we go back into the legal issue being the lack of registration, same as RE-T, um, and, and indeed 
Lady Black and Lord Stevens' judgments when they dealt with issues of possibility of criminal offence. Um, you, you, you've, you've got, I'll just give you the references. You've got Lady Blackett 143 and 145, where they, they refer to the possibility of a criminal offence. And, and Lady Black, you, you remember 143, 145 is the part where Lady Black says, well, this is quite a challenging point. But then she answers it in 145. So she was, she was mindful of that. It wasn't a point that was missed. And she concluded the inherent jurisdiction could still be used in such circumstances. And, and Lord Stevens is the same. The, the references to that are 168, 169. And again, underlying all of that is the much wider principle of welfare and protection of the child. So that is what I, what I believe to be the main points advanced on why our case should be different from routine and the outcome. I think then all that's left for me to do is to briefly touch base with the remainder of the appeal grounds, but I think I've covered most of that territory already. Uh, and then the final point I said I'd touch on, which is the secure accommodation point. So to finish off the grounds, uh, we've... Uh, Covered in. Could I? Yes, please. Forgive me. Just to go, you, you just glossed over Lord Stevens, 168169. Yes. Can I just, just, hmm. uh, does 169 provide perhaps rather more clear support for your submission? I, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear that. 169. Yes. Does that provide. Does that underline your submission, as it were? Underline, not undermine. Yes, yes, he, 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 yes, I thought I was just simply seeking to save time, that's all no, no. the references, but um, 169, he, the point I was making by referring to it is he expressly engages with the issue of criminal charge, and he says that H, the existence of the defence of criminal charge, misplaces the focus of inherent jurisdiction, which is at yeah. all times on the child. Well, that's, and don't. you would say that that's the case now, just yes. as much as it was before the amendments to your regula the regulation. Yes, and also ties up with the point I just made about it being a wider principle, or having a wider underlying base. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, <clears throat> so then to finish off the appeal grounds, our skeleton paragraphs 37, 39, uh, which is at uh, Core Bundle C for Charlie 10. Um, that is the in accordance with the law point. The requirement of being in accordance with the law is um, the court's decision issue, which is the decision on the deprivation. And you'll note that I pointed out parts of Lady Black's judgment where, where, where she mentioned the deprivation in terms of importance of the law requirement and that, that's a different decision to, to, to place them by local authority um, and paragraph 41 looking to the legality of the deprivation decision rather than placement decision uh, and, and I pointed out really to uh, paragraph 90 where I drew attention to the specific wording used by Lady Black on that um, and we've said that the the, the common law forms part of domestic law for required purposes. And you saw that mentioned briefly by each of the majority judges yesterday. Lady Black at 150, where she references common law in terms of the in accordance with the law requirement. I'm happy to go back to that to show you where the words are on the page to assist. Um, and similarly, Lord Stevens at paragraph 175, where he refers to 175 letter D, where he, he says, in domestic law, which includes the inherent jurisdiction. So the inherent jurisdiction is part of common law, in that way, uh, forms part of the national law for the purposes of the importance of the law requirement. Uh, we've given you 
reference to Strasbourg cases on the common law being considered to be part of national law, many times in Toulouse and France. I'm happy to take them to you for, if they were assist, but um, maybe that it's a sufficiently uncontroversial proposition that you, you don't need to see the case themselves. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and then the final points we've covered on the grounds. Skeleton, paragraph 48, <clears throat> which is it, for bundle C for Charlie 12, uh, the, the breach of the national law going to the power, power to detain, authority to detain, um, set out in, in those paragraphs. I don't need to go over that ground again. The end ground two, we've covered in the skeleton briefly. Um, we, the main point is we, we say that in terms of cutting across the statutory scheme, um, the issue is no different to that decided in RIT. You say it doesn't cut across the statutory scheme because we're not in a territory D prohibition, D plus 27A prohibition. And in any event, for the same reasons analysed by the Supreme Court in RIT, which were wider as well. And just going back to, um, sorry, very quickly, to the first ground, mm. it, um, you would weigh the extent of the breach of the registration requirements in relation to the placement as part of the assessment, would you, of... The, the decision whether or not to authorise the deprivation of liberty. Yes, that, that would, is. That would come into the exercise. Yes. In that way. Yes. Yes. I, I think the precise way in which that decision is made is probably best described in my friend Ms. Clement's skeleton. So that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But you put it very nicely in terms of the way the decision is, is made. I wouldn't seek to improve on, on her words there. Um, but again, numerous judges have described that process. I don't, I don't seek to take you further than what's already been said. Um, uh, <coughs> and then, uh, unless there's anything I can assist you with on ground two in particular, I, I don't mean to skip over it, but I simply think it's, it's covered by the points that have already been raised under ground one. <coughs> um, of course, happy to assist the court in any, in any way they would wish. Um, the, the, the final point then is the issue uh, that was mentioned yesterday on secure accommodation. I'll just briefly touch on that. Um, <coughs> words into anyone's mouth, but I think what what what. what Maybe, maybe it's just yesterday, is that um, the accommodation here could or should be regarded as secure accommodation for purposes of section 25. Um, if that is the, the, the point, um, it's not one that was considered by Mr Justice MacDonald. He didn't engage with the possible treatment of the accommodation as secure accommodation under section 25. If you want to know where we look to for knowing whether something is secure accommodation in section 25, well, that's in Lady Black's judgment, paragraphs 131 to 139. Um, and the focus, you know, very happy to take the court through those passages if it would, if it would assist. Um, but that the focus is on the accommodation itself and whether that accommodation was designed to restrict liberty. Um, and you have Lady Black's two types, either the building designed for the purpose category or the second category of um, building having as its primary purpose um, the restriction of liberty. Uh, and that second category would be a very limited category um, given that the purpose for much accommodation would be care or treatment rather than the deprivation of 
book being designed for restriction of liberty. Um, the, the present case, we hadn't understood the property to be an issue, the property issue to be one that was designed for the purpose of restriction of liberty, uh, and therefore within Lady Black's judgment. But again, if we were to go into that, it would be a factual question which wasn't considered by Miss Justice MacDonald or wasn't subject to findings. So I'm not sure the Court of Appeal could really do much with that point in any event. Um, in any event, uh, to the extent of the issues that you're being asked to deal with, the end result would be to only present with a, another possible obstacle which uh, the re principle may have to engage with. And it would be, if we got that far, it would be that principle in re paragraph 124, which was the secure accommodation point there. So I'm not sure how far that takes us because it just adds another issue which you look to re applying to. Um, I hope that makes sense. If I can just speak with me, just turn my back to Chair. Yes, certainly. Anything else? Anything else? No. Unless I can the court, though, the submission. No, we haven't. Thank you very much, Mr. Auburn. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Clement. <clears throat> Lord, if I could just move things around a moment. Yes, please do. My Lord, I want to start with the structure of my submissions and outline where I'm going to go. I hope then that makes it easier to follow. I'm going to start with three preliminary points, which I'll outline for the court in a moment. I'm then going to make some short submissions on the construction point, because I can see that is still um, a point that is troubling the court. My third heading is to make submissions on Article 5. What does Article 5 require? And importantly, what is the High Court doing when it invokes the inherent jurisdiction? to authorise the deprivation of liberty of a child. My fourth point is to make some submissions <coughs> on what the Supreme Court actually decided in re -T. Now, listening to Mr Drabble yesterday, <coughs> one might have gained the impression that the Supreme Court was only concerned with the question of whether the inherent jurisdiction could be used to authorise a deprivation of liberty in an unregistered children's home, where the only concern was that that would be a criminal offence <coughs> on the part of the provider. That was obviously a point that troubled the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court also considered a separate and distinct argument under Section 25 of the <coughs> Children Act for Secure Accommodation and Regulation 3 of the Secure Accommodation Regulation. The appellant's argument in T was that it would cut across the statutory scheme and would be a breach of Article 5 to authorise the deprivation of liberty in a placement which was a registered <coughs> children's home, but where the local authority had no power to place because it was not approved for use as secure accommodation. So I say the Supreme Court has already considered and rejected Mr. Drabble's statutory prohibition or ultra-virus argument. That was a fundamental part of the Supreme Court's judgment. It's a crucial part of their reasoning. That reasoning bound Mr. Justice MacDonald. And in my submission, it binds this court. <coughs> so the court has already dealt with and rejected the argument advanced by Mr. Drabble. My fifth heading is that I'm going to bring all these points together and respond in terms to Mr. Drabble's grounds one and two. And then finally, point six, I want to respond to a few points that were made by um, Ms. Kavanagh yesterday. <coughs> So turning then to my preliminary <coughs> points, I have three. The first is that Ofsted is the registration authority for children's homes and in England and the regulator of that sector. Those functions have been conferred upon Her Majesty's Chief Inspector by Parliament under primary legislation. Ofsted, like the court, is very concerned about the issue of capacity in the registered children's home sector. It is that lack of capacity that is giving rise to the increasing number of cases coming before the High Court 
under the inherent jurisdiction. Ofsted does understand the difficulties that local authorities are facing when it comes to caring for those children. However, Parliament has enacted a regulatory regime for children's homes that is designed to safeguard and protect some of the most vulnerable children in society. Parliament has laid down those minimum quality standards that are necessary to secure the welfare of looked after children who are placed in children's homes. And Ofsted considers that it is perverse that it is those children who have the most complex needs, whose needs are the most difficult to meet, who are being denied the protection of those quality standards and are being denied the protection of the entire regulatory regime. Ofsted also shares the concern expressed by my Lord the President yesterday that the court is being forced to become some sort of quasi-regulator in these inherent jurisdiction cases where the children's home is not registered. We say that is plainly not the court's function. In England, that function has been conferred by Parliament upon Ofsted. And I mean no disrespect when I say that the court is not equipped to carry out that task. I don't think anyone would say that it was. My Lord, my second preliminary point is on the statutory construction issue. I didn't make submissions on this before Mr Justice MacDonald. And in my skeleton argument for this court, I also indicated that Ofsted did not take a position on this. However, as I've indicated, I can see that the court is still perhaps troubled by the correct approach to construction. And so I do intend to make a few short submissions on this. We say it's a straightforward point, but I will come to that under my second point. My third preliminary point is that Parliament has determined that whenever a child is placed in a children's that children's home should be registered with Ofsted. We see that from the Care Standards Act 2000. We see that from section 22C, 5, little c of the Children Act itself. Ofsted, of course, agrees with that as a matter of policy. It is part of Ofsted's brazen death. <coughs> but Ofsted recognises <coughs> that in the kind of emergency situations that were outlined by the Secretary of State in RE-T, and this, for your note, is recorded at paragraph 180 of Lady Arden's judgment. That exceptional circumstances may arise where it is not possible to meet a child's needs in a children's home that is currently registered. Now, that would usually occur in an emergency situation. So there's either been a placement breakdown or there is some sort of need to create an urgent, bespoke placement to keep the child safe for a very short period while the placement is either registered or an alternative placement is found. The trouble is it's not exceptional circumstances. Really. My Lord, it may have been three years ago when I was dealing with these cases at first instance, but it isn't now. It's becoming well, the norm. But my Lord, and that's the point that troubles Ofsted. It should not be the norm. It cannot, we say, in accordance with VT, become the norm and that what needs to happen in accordance with the President's guidance is that if the local authority intends these to be anything other than an emergency placement, the provider must register. They have to be brought back within the statutory regime. And that is what um, Mr Justice MacDonald is trying to address in his second judgment. And while he did not quite go as far as Ofsted had invited him to do, it is plain from that judgment that the court should not ordinarily authorise the deprivation of liberty of a child in an unregistered children's home. Is Austin monitoring these cases, keeping track of what's happening in these cases? Are cases dragging on for months and months and months with children in unregistered homes? Or, or does in each case in due course um, find its right outcome? My Lord, there were some statistics that I provided to Mr Justice MacDonald on the last occasion. I'm afraid I don't have those to hand at the moment, but we can provide those if it would help the court. 
What tends to happen in these cases, because the court doesn't know what is going on on the ground, they're making directions requiring Ofsted to file evidence about the status <coughs> of the registration application. And so Ofsted is being drawn into these proceedings. But as is often the case, if no one is, provi if no, if no one is actually applying to register, then there's very little assistance that Ofsted can give. Because Ofsted doesn't know what's happening on the ground. Because Ofsted's jurisdiction to inspect and regulate this provision only arises in respect of children's homes that are registered in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's why, my lord, that I would say in, in your lordship's guidance, the emphasis is so much on applying to register very quickly. Mm. Within, I believe, it's, I can't remember now if it's seven or ten days, but it's it's very quick. I think there's a further problem in that the court service don't count these cases as a separate category, so it's not possible to press a button on the computer and yes, say that there were, and there, were, there were 75 of them last month or 10, and Ofsted it's, only knows what it knows, and so if there's a case and the parties never contact Ofsted, um, you, you do, don't even know that exists. Well, look, my lord, that's what the addendum to your guidance was intended mm. to address. Yes. So every time the court makes an order authorising the deprivation of liberty in an unregistered children's mm -hmm. home, they should, the local authority should, immediately notify Ofsted. Yeah. Um, but again, Ofsted's hands are tied in terms of how quickly does the provider apply to register. Would it be very good if, we, if a streamlined system of monitoring these cases could be, maybe it exists already, I don't know, but if it doesn't, it would be a good thing to set up in some way. Well, my Lord, Ofsted has adopted a streamlined or a fast-track process for registration to deal with these cases. So once the application comes in, it can be dealt with very swiftly. Um, and again, that, that, um, that guidance is, is in Mr. McDo Mr. Justice MacDonald's second judgment. Um, so there is a process in place to deal with it. Um, but I can't, as I'm standing here now, um, answer the question as to how, how are they all being monitored. I, I can certainly update your Lordship once, um, once I sit down. Um, my Lord, so I was making the point about it should only be in an exceptional circumstance and in an emergency situation. It shouldn't become the standard that a child is placed in an unregistered children's home. The, the fact that, that my Lord's observation, and he's entirely right about the number of cases, but the fact that there are more cases doesn't mean, as night follows day, that these are not emergencies, no. that there's more emergencies, uh, and it's exceptional for each case, what you want to avoid is it, it becoming then accepted that that will be the status quo and the, the children's home will remain unregistered and no one will bother about it. And that's that's what we're all aiming to My avoid. Lord, that's, that's right. Avoid, that, avoid that becoming the norm. That was mm. the problem with some of the cases before Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Justice McDonald in his second case, where a child had been in an unregistered children's home for, for up to six months. Yes. And there's still no date as to when an application will be put will be submitted to Ofsted for registration, and that is very concerning to Ofsted because the child is without the protections that Parliament has said they are entitled to for an extended period of time. So we say that was not what was envisaged by the Supreme Court in UT, and it was certainly not what was envisaged by Parliament. Um, my Lord, so while Parliament in the Children's Act, in the Children Act, did expressly preserve the existence of the inherent jurisdiction, where that is necessary to prevent significant harm to a child, as as we've just said, um, my Lord, it is not the situation that the inherent jurisdiction can be used or should be invoked to allow the continuation of this state of affairs outside of that emergency situation. Um, my Lord, one sees the Supreme Court carefully tracing the history of Section 100 of the Children Act into itself. Um, Parliament has decided to preserve it. It does exist. But what Reti was looking at is the circumstances where it can be invoked when it would cut across other provisions that Parliament has laid down. Um, and while the Supreme Court in T noted the existence of other duties, the overarching duty to safeguard and promote the welfare of children imposed on local authorities, and also the operational duties under Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention, um, the Supreme Court wasn't saying that one will always trump the other. What the Supreme Court did in T 
was to resolve the tension between the need for these basic protections for children, i.e. compliance with the statutory regime, and this other set of duties, which is also seeking to protect and preserve the life of them, of very vulnerable children. And what the Supreme Court said is that the High Court can invoke the inherent jurisdiction to authorise a deprivation of liberty in respect of a placement outside of the statutory scheme, or in the words of Mr Drabble, uh, something that is prohibited by the statutory scheme, or is ultra-virus the statutory scheme, but only subject to the conditions that the Supreme Court laid down including the conditions that the placement is brought back within the statutory framework as soon as possible and in accordance with my Lord the President's guidance. And it's those conditions that limit the extent to which an order authorising a deprivation of liberty can cut across the statutory scheme. So that is the thing that the Supreme Court decided in UT. We say that principled approach binds this court and gives the answer to the difficulty that Mr Drabble has identified. And we say that is right, even if Mr Drabble is correct, that there is a statutory prohibition on placing a child in an unregistered children's home. Yes. So my lord, turning to my second heading, the construction point. We say this is a simple point of statutory construction, and I'm going to take it in stages. Point one, if a looked after child cannot be accommodated under section 22C2, so in other words, if the child can't be placed with a parent or someone with PR, then under section 22C5, the local authority must place the child in the placement which is, in their opinion, the most appropriate placement available. And it might help when I'm making these submissions if we open 22C, which is at A68 in the authorities table. So we're in subsection five. The authority must place the child in the placement which is the most appropriate placement available. It's not may, it's not if you feel like it, it's must. The term placement is then defined in subsection six. It is defined as meaning one of four things. Those are the only four things that may be placements. We know an unregistered children home, children's home can't fall within A because that's dependent on them being a local authority foster. <coughs> We know it can't fall within B, because again, that's about foster parents. We know it can't fall within C, as a matter of ordinary domestic con law construction, because C is concerned only with a children's home in respect of which a person is registered. So it can't fall within C. And we say it also can't fall within D, because if D was broad enough to cover unregistered children's homes, then a local authority would simply be able to bypass the express requirement in C that the children's home must be registered. D was intended to deal with other arrangements which were not foster placements or children's homes. So we say, as a matter of basic domestic construction, there has always been a prohibition, mm -hmm. as a matter of domestic law, on placing a child in an unregistered children's home. Now, my Lord, we say that's not surprising, because when one goes back to the Care Standards Act in 2000, which was enacted eight years before Section 22C was uh, inserted into the Children Act, Parliament had imposed a mandatory requirement for a provider and a manager of a children's home to register. Parliament, in the Care Standards Act, made it's it... Sec a, section 11, is that...? Uh, sec section 5, my lord, yes. Oh, if, we, if we look at it... Um, uh, 
Uh, no, I'm sorry, Section 5 is the registration authority. Yes, Section 11 is where they must register. And it's not only you must register, but if you don't register, you're committing a criminal offence. That's Section 11 of the case standards there. So we say it follows as night follows day that Parliament cannot have intended in 2008, when they inserted Section 22C, to expressly permit a local authority to place a child in an unregistered children's home. Mr. Drabble invited you to look at this as a question, and this is my terminology, not his, but as a question of literal interpretation, meaning if it doesn't fall within A, B, C, and A, B, and C, it must fall within D. I say one has to look at this proposedly. Parliament would never have intended to expressly authorise a local authority to place a child in an unregistered children's home where that inevitably involved the commission of a criminal offence. It simply would not have happened. So we say, as a matter of ordinary domestic construction, yes, there is a pro prohibition on a local authority placing a child in an unregistered children's home. But that prohibition comes from Section 22C itself. And it's not something that has been newly introduced by the 2021 regulation. Because if an unregistered children's home never came within little d at all, then introducing a new prohibition in the 2021 regulations about what can be done under little d says nothing about unregistered children's homes. So the regulations don't change a thing when it comes to the question of unregistered children's homes. This isn't a lacuna or a gap in the statutory scheme. The effect of the statutory scheme is that as a matter of domestic law, ordinary domestic construction, a local authority cannot place a child in anything other than the four placements in 22C6. That's domestic law. Now, if that construction means that a child's Article 2 and Article 3 rights under the Convention would be breached because a local authority is not able to place them in an unregistered children's home, which is the only possible option that could keep them safe from that kind of harm, then the Human Rights Act comes into play. We say this isn't quite the RETI principle, as perhaps um, my learned friend Mr. Auburn put it, because the RETI principle is about the court's powers when it exercises the inherent jurisdiction. T was not saying anything about a local authority's power to place a child. And that's why I coined the distinction that was used by Mr. Justice MacDonald, that there is a distinction between a power to place local authorities' power to place, and the court's authority to detain, which is what the Supreme Court was concerned with in T. Now, how does the Human Rights Act come into play if there would otherwise be a breach? Well, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act can't give the local authority a freestanding power to do something which it couldn't otherwise do because Section 6.1 doesn't apply because of Section 6.2a. Primary legislation says you can't do that. So the only way it can work is through Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, where so far as it's possible to do so, primary legislation must be read and given effect in a way that's compatible with convention rights. So words would need to be read into Section 22c6, to avoid a breach of the child's convention rights by enabling a local authority to place the child in the unregistered children's home. Now, that can only be done so as to avoid a breach of Article 2 or 3 of the convention. It will only be done where the protective operational duties in Article 2 and 3 are triggered. And it will only permit accommodation in the unregistered children's home for the minimum time necessary to achieve registration. Because then there is no breach.
So we say, if we're in that territory, then there is no statutory prohibition at all. So this is a very interesting legal argument, but not one that the court needs to engage with, because the premise for Mr. Gravel's argument can't be made out. But my point is, is, is more than that. It's that even if you're with Mr. Drabble and that there is a statutory prohibition on placing a child in an unregistered children's home, however that may come about, that doesn't matter because the Supreme Court has already dealt with that <coughs> point in Reti. My Lord, that, that's the short point I wanted to make on construction. I, I hope that clarifies things as to where Ofsted stands on that. The third item in my list is my submissions about Article 5. Yes. And the starting point for this is to actually look at what Article 5 says. And, um, my Lords, my Lady, you'll find that at page A6 of the Authorities Bundle. My Lady, that's page 8 of the electronic version. <coughs> <coughs> and I know this, this is often trite, but sometimes one forgets the wording of the article. <coughs> one, everyone assumes that we know what it says. So everyone has the right to liberty and security of the person. No one shall be deprived of his liberty, save in the following cases. So it's got to be for one of these purposes in ATF. And in accordance with a procedure prescribed by law. And I'll come back in a moment to explain what Strasbourg says that means. And the only purpose that we are concerned with here is the D, the detention of a minor, and again the important words, the detention of a minor by lawful order for the purpose of educational supervision. That, that's what we're concerned with here. So then one says, well, what does that mean? What, what does Strasbourg say that means? And I suggest there's a useful summary of this in the James Wells and Lee case, which is at tab B6. <coughs> the authorities bundle. Um, my lady, it's at uh, page uh, 254 of the electronic version. So what was the internal page on? B6, did you say? Uh, B173 is where I it starts, my lord. I'm oh, sorry, I have the tabs, I have the hard copy page numbers and the electronic page numbers. Oh, well, well, we, we haven't got tabs on our... Uh, I, I, I do apologise. It's B173, my lord. Okay. That, that's where the judgment starts. The court's assessment starts at paragraph 187, which is at page B213, or 294, my lady, of the electronic version. I'm using the paper for the minute. Oh, right. So B, uh, B213. So what does it mean? So 187. The court reiterates at the outset that the object and purpose of Article 5 is to ensure that no one is dispossessed of his liberty in an arbitrary fashion. So it's free, being free from arbitrary detention at the hands of the authorities. And then goes on to the top of 188. It is well established in the court's case law that any deprivation of liberty must fall within one of the exceptions and must also be lawful. And that's, those are the words in inverted commas at 188. They must be lawful. Um, 189 then goes on to, to look at A, which we're, we're not concerned with. But then paragraph 190, where the lawfulness of detention is an issue, and again I emphasise it's the lawfulness of detention, the convention refers essentially to national law and lays down the obligation to conform to the substantive and procedural rules of national law. And I say, about detention. Um, and then 191 goes on to say, having regard to the object and purpose of Article 5.1, it's clear that compliance with national law is not sufficient. It's also got to be in keeping with the purpose of protecting the individual from arbitrariness. Um, and then it goes on to set out what does the court mean about arbitrariness. And one sees that at 192. Um, detention will be arbitrary where, if despite complying with the letter of national law, and again I say in brackets about detention, there has been an element of bad faith or deception on the part of the authorities. In 193, 
that the order to detain and the execution of the detention genuinely conform with the purpose of the restrictions. And one sees the discussion of what that means in the context of 5.1d about halfway down that paragraph. And then third, for a deprivation of liberty not to be arbitrary, there must be some relationship between the ground of permitted deprivation of liberty relied on and the place and conditions of detention. So that is the only thing that Strasbourg says about the place of detention. It's not that it has to be lawful as a matter of domestic law. It's that there has to be some relationship. Again, there's, there's a lot of authority that it's not even a particularly close relationship, but some relationship between the ground of the permitted detention and the place and conditions of detention. And that's the only context in which Strasbourg is concerned about the place of detention. It is concerned under Article 5 with the lawfulness of the detention, not where it takes place. Place and conditions. Yes, my lady, yes. And then they go on to say, after, after the citation of um, Saadi in 194, thus as noted above, detention for educational supervision pursuant to Article 5.1d must take place in a setting and with the resources to meet the necessary educational objectives. So that's that's the only thing the court says about the placement. And my lord, just to complete that run through, um, paragraph 195, there's also the requirement that detention, um, not the arbitrary, implies the need for a relationship of proportionality between the ground of detention relied on and the detention in question. Um, so then one goes back to the question of, well, what does it mean to say that the deprivation of liberty must be lawful or happen by lawful order? And we see that from Strasbourg in, just as one of the exam many examples, in the case of Benham and UK, which is at tab, um, sorry, you don't have tabs, page B483 of the hard copy bundle. So page B483. Thank you. I didn't want to stop you, but, but didn't um, the Supreme Court resolve these issues in, in re T. My Lord, absolutely. The Supreme Court adopted what I submitted to them about Benham in that what you need for it to be lawful is that there is a lawful order of the court. Mm, yeah. Once you have an order of the court under the inherent jurisdiction, mm. that's the end of it. You've got a lawful order. Mm. One is not looking under Article 5 for Article 5 purposes at whether the underlying placement, the place where the child is detained, complies with national law. Mm. That's simply not the question. So my Lord, I entirely agree. St um, the Supreme Court has dealt with it. They've dealt with it in reliance on, on, the, on this there. basis. Um, and my Lord, for, for your Lordship's note, um, it's the paragraph at uh, paragraph 42, period of detention will in principle be lawful if it is carried out pursuant to a court order. Paragraph 32. 40. 42. 40. 40. Sorry, Miss Sir. Thank you. And that is what Lady Black adopted in paragraph 150 of reading. Yes. So one then asks, what is it that the High Court is doing when it invokes the inherent jurisdiction to authorise a deprivation of liberty? And my Lord, I agree entirely with what uh, Lord Justice Baker said yesterday, that a local authority doesn't need a court order to place a child. It has a duty or a power to place a child under section 20 of the children, to accommodate the child under section 20 of the Children Act, if those preconditions are made out. And if the child is the subject of a care order, the local authority has a duty to accommodate the child under section 22A. So one doesn't need a court order to achieve any of that. One only needs to involve the court at all if the child is being deprived of liberty in the place where they're being accommodated by a local authority. Why does one need the court? Because Strasbourg says one can only deprive a minor of liberty under 5.1d if there is a lawful order. So what the court is doing in deciding, is deciding whether to authorise the deprivation of liberty in the placement and subject to the restrictions decided upon by the local authority. Now, Mr. Drabble makes much of this and says, well, it's all about a particular placement. Well, I say, well, of course it is. 
because the court doesn't authorise the deprivation of liberty of a child in the abstract. The court has to know where is the child going to be deprived of their liberty and on what terms, particularly if the court's been asked to authorise restraint, for example, or um, a medical restraint or something of that nature. So what is the court doing? The court is a public authority for the purposes of the Human Rights Act. The court itself is under a duty to act compatibly with Article 5 and can only authorise a deprivation of liberty in accordance with Article 5. And what have the courts done? Well, the domestic courts have moulded and adapted the inherent jurisdiction so as to comply with Article 5. My Lord, I'm not going to turn these out, but for your Lordship's note, it's one sees that from the judgment of Mr Justice Mumby in Weave PS, which is at page B309, and the language of moulding and adapting the inherent jurisdiction is at paragraph 22. That was in respect of vulnerable adults and to fill the ball with gap, but one sees the same approach taken to children again by uh, Sir James Mumby, as he then was, in re the re-AF litigation. He still is. Uh, <laughs> Lord, of course, the, the <laughs> president, as he then was. <laughs> That's outside of my power, my Lord. Um, <laughs> but yet, one sees, it, one sees that approach applied to children in the re-AF litigation. Um, that's in the bundle as well, B135. And one sees what the court is doing in paragraph 27, which is at page B143. <clears throat> uh, sorry, it starts at 143, it's on 144. Um, and Sir James makes clear there that the exercise of the inherent jurisdiction in this way, to authorise the deprivation of liberty of a child, must comply with the substantive and procedural requirements of Article 5. That's, that's what the court... Sorry, which paragraph were you reading from then? And sorry, that's 27.4. My Lord, the, the notes of what one takes from these two cases are in my skeleton argument, so I, I won't detain the court now by turning those out. So, my Lord, that's the end of my third point, what does Article 5 require? One then looks, fourth on my list, what did the Supreme Court actually decide in meeting? And in my submission, the point I want, the overarching point I want to make Mr. Drabble, as always, advanced very clear and cogent submissions. But it is very important for the court to realise that for once, these submissions are not novel. Exactly this kind of argument was advanced by the appellant in re -T. And I'll show the court that in a moment. But the case I had to meet for the Secretary of State in T was as follows. The appellant said there is a statutory prohibition on the placement in question. So in Mr. Drabble's language, it was ultra virus the power of the local authority to make the placement. It was said that the inherent jurisdiction could not be used to authorise a deprivation of liberty in such a placement because this would cut across the statutory scheme and would breach Article 5 because it didn't comply with the requirements of national law. Similarity with the submissions Mr. Drabble has made to you is obvious. But the Supreme Court rejected that submission. And I'll now show um, your Lordships and your Ladyship that. We've, we've seen um, others have turned up the, the actual arguments. I can do this very quickly, if the court will bear with me. One sees paragraph 15 of Re T, page B42. the outline of the appellant's case, it's when there's a statutory bar under section 102D of the Children Act, well, we're not concerned with that now, but the court got rid of that argument. Point two is that the inherent jurisdiction must not be used in a way to cut across the statutory scheme in the Children Act, as it would be here. And point three, it's that deprivation of liberty would breach Article 5. Now, the treatment of the Article 5 argument starts at paragraph... 81, which is on page, a uh, treatment of Article 5 rather starts at page B59.
And my lady, it's, it's perhaps important to look at paragraph 83 for the point that your ladyship put to uh, Mr. Auburn, um, that one of the arguments the appellant advanced was that placement of a child in a children's home that is not regulated, they mean they're registered, um, <coughs> offers no guarantee of educational supervision. So it's a complaint about the quality of the placement. Um, and again, one, one sees um, the argument advanced there. There's no regime where the nature and quality of the provision is prescribed and inspected, etc., etc. But that argument was not adopted by the Supreme Court either, as I'll go on to show you. Um, but one then sees the court discussing the Article 5 case law, and one sees then at paragraph 89... And then these are the same references, Mr. Auburn. Exactly. Right. But, but the court is saying it's mm. not in accordance. With, the argument is it's not in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law. So I'm not going to repeat that. But one then sees how the appellant put that argument and built on it at paragraph 94. And then the heading at section B that Mr. Auburn took you to, B68, is where the argument is spelt out. And the point I want to dwell on is not the point that Mr. Auburn made about unregistered children's homes. I want to take the court to the other argument that was being advanced by the appellant, which was in respect of the second placement, which was a registered children's home but where there was a statutory prohibition on using it as secure accommodation. And before I do that and show you how the Supreme Court dealt with it, I'd just like to um, invite your Lordships and your Ladyship to look at the terms of Section 25 of the Children Act. It's A75. And the point I wish to make is that this is a statutory prohibition or the same ultra-virus point that Mr. Drabble is advancing now, there was a statutory prohibition in Section 25, it would have been ultra-virus for the local authority to use this as secure accommodation. So if we look at Section 25, A75, subject to the following provisions of this section, a child who has been looked after by a local authority may not be placed and if placed, may not be kept in accommodation provided for the purpose of restricting liberty, so may not be kept in secure accommodation, unless certain conditions are met. That's what 25.1 says. Then we then go down to 25.7, which is over the page. The Secretary of State may, by regulations, provide that, and then I'd invite the court to look at subsection D, a child may only be placed in secure accommodation that is of a description specified in the regulations. And the description may in particular be framed by reference to whether the accommodation or the person providing it has been approved by the Secretary of State or the Scottish Ministers. So my Lord, this is a statutory prohibition. It would be ultra virus to do something to provide for the local authority to provide accommodation, secure accommodation, other than in accordance with these regulations. So one looks at what the regulations say, and the current version of those is the one I handed out yesterday. I don't know where your lordship put that, whether it's no. free It was loose, wasn't it? It was loose, Very dangerous. yes. <coughs> yeah. But we have, I say, in regulation three, a statutory bar. Accommodation in a children's home shall not be used as secure accommodation unless, in the case of accommodation in England, it has been approved by the Secretary of State for that use. So it would be ultra virus for a local authority to use accommodation in a registered children's home as secure accommodation if it hasn't been approved by the Secretary of State for that use. And that was the argument being advanced by the appellant. In tea. It's not only about unregistered children's homes, there were two placements in T. So we then turn back to T to see how um, Lady Black deals with that argument. And first of all, so one, one sees the argument spelt out at 124, 125. Mr. Auburn's taking you to that, I'm not going to repeat it, but that's where the argument is. 
So first of all, Lady Black says, well, the first question to ask is, was this secure accommodation at all? Because if it's not, the statutory bar, the Ultra Vares Act, doesn't apply. So Lady Black discusses that from paragraph 130 onwards through to 138, where one sees the conclusion that it's only going to be secure accommodation if it's designed for or has its primary, the accommodation is designed for or has its primary purpose of restricting liberty. And at 138, she accepted the Secretary of State's submission that the only accommodation that's properly designed for restricting liberty is a secure children's home. And then the second category, the purpose designed category, um, she accepted my submission that um, the Secretary of State's correct in saying that a conversation outside a purpose built unit um, will usually have as its primary purpose the provision of care and or treatment for the child rather than preventing the child absconding or causing harm to him or herself or others. So it's very unlikely to be secure <coughs> outside of <coughs> children. But that, that's where she's dealing with that first question. Well, is it secure accommodation at all? And she concludes at the end, the last sentence of 138, where the placement is not secure accommodation, there can be no question of the use of the inherent jurisdiction cutting across the statutory scheme in section 25. But, Lady Black says in 139, there may be placements which can properly be said to be secure accommodation within the meaning of section 25 but which cannot be used as such, i.e. there's the statutory prohibition, there's the Ultravirus Act, because they are children's homes that have not been approved by the Secretary of State in accordance with Regulation 3. And Lady Black says, well, hang on a moment, that's, that's quite difficult, isn't it? The argument that the making of an order under the inherent jurisdiction, authorising placement in accommodation of this type, would cut unacceptably across the statutory scheme, cannot be dismissed easily. Right, it couldn't be dismissed easily. But she then goes on to say, yes, I do ultimately dismiss it. And one sees paragraph 140, one sets out what my submission was on that point. Paragraph 141, she starts the paragraph by summarising what everyone else had said. Um, about halfway down between E and F, Lady Black sets out her concern that these are very problematic cases, it's been going on for years. But then her conclusion, cases such as those to which I have alluded earlier in this judgment, i.e. including the secure accommodation argument, demonstrate, it seems to me, that it's unthinkable that the High Court, with its long established role of protecting children, should have no means to keep these unfortunate children safe from extreme harm in some case death. If the local authority cannot apply for an order under Section 25, because there is no Section 25 compliant secure accommodation available, I would accept that the inherent jurisdiction can and will have to be used to fill that gap without clashing impermissibly with the statutory scheme. So that is Lady Black rejecting the appellant's argument in T that there is a statutory prohibition on using secure accommodation in this way that it would be ultra virus the act of a local authority to place a child in secure accommodation in this way. But she rejects it. You can still use the inherent jurisdiction in that situation. So that is why I say that even if Mr. Drabble is right that there's a statutory prohibition, even if he is right that it is a statutory prohibition of a different kind to the criminal act, the criminalization of operating and managing a registered children's home. That doesn't change the analysis in re T. Because T also found that even if there's a prohibit, statutory prohibition, even if there's a statutory bar, you can still use the inherent jurisdiction to authorise the deprivation of liberty of a child as long as you comply with the conditions which Lady Black goes on to set out in the following paragraphs. So those are the conditions of imperative conditions of necessity to avoid grave harm to a child and that you bring the, the placement back into the statutory scheme. So that is why I say, even if Mr. Drabble is right at each stage of the analysis, the answer is still determined by T. 
Um, my Lord, the last point I must make on Wee T is just to deal with the high point of Mr. Drabble's case, which was that Lady Arden says something different, and silently the rest of the Supreme Court must have been agreeing with her. I say that can't possibly be right, um, because whatever Lady Arden may or may not have said, and whatever she may have thought on the statutory prohibition point uh, around um, criminalisation of, of unregistered children's homes, the majority didn't agree with her. And we see that, it, and rather it doesn't reflect, it's additional reasoning to what was advanced by the majority. And we see that from Lady Arden's judgment, at B, it starts at B83. One sees at paragraph 179, the first paragraph, Lady Arden says, I've had difficulty with the limits of the inherent jurisdiction of the court in this case. So in this judgment, I set out my additional reasons for agreeing with the judgments of Lady Black and Lord Stevens on that issue. So she agrees entirely with what Lady Black and Lord Stevens say, but is putting forward additional reasons confirming those reasons are not in the judgments of Lady Black and Lord Stevens. Um, one also <coughs> sees that at paragraph 187. Uh, one, one sees just in the paragraph before that, she summarises the submissions from the Association of Lawyers for Children, who submitted <coughs> the third route, which is the route Lady Arden ultimately liked that on its true interpretation, Section 11 does not criminalise the placement by the local authority or the making of the court. She says, I've yet to deal with that submission, but she goes on to do it. But she says, the way I would additionally analyse the matter, so additional to what Lord Stevens and Lady Black um, had said. So I say that Lady Arden's judgment can provide no support to Mr Drabble's submission, that in fact this analysis by Lady Arden was adopt, reflected the views of the majority or was somehow ado um, adopted by them. My Lord, the fifth point in my list um, is simply to bring, to get, bring all of this together and respond to, to Mr Drabble's grounds. Um, and what we say is that even if somehow the 2021 regulations do prohibit the placement of children in unregistered children's homes, and you have my submission that that's not what they do, that simply doesn't change the analysis in RE-T. That's the end of the matter in my submission. Now, I adopt what Mr. Alban said about how the Supreme Court dealt with registered children's, unregistered children's homes. Um, and in that scenario, the Supreme Court was even prepared to invoke the inherent jurisdiction to authorise deprivation of liberty, even if it would amount to a criminal offence committed by a third party. That's the most serious thing, the most significant way in which the law can be breached. So I say it's obvious that if they were prepared to countenance the, um, the commission of a criminal offence, they would certainly be prepared to, commission, to countenance an ultra-various act on the part of a local authority. But I don't need to do that by implication. The Supreme Court dealt with the argument, the very argument that Mr Drabble advances, that there was a statutory prohibition, it's ultra-various act on the part of a local authority, and the Supreme Court dealt with that. They rejected it. So I say that is the simple, straightforward <coughs> answer um, to this case. Ground two is, to some extent, the precursor to ground one. Um, but essentially, <coughs> what, what I say on behalf of Ofsted is that the Supreme Court in T says the question is whether invoking the inherent jurisdiction impermissibly cuts across the statutory scheme. And what T says is it doesn't <coughs> impermissibly do it as long as the conditions are Um, my final point is just a very short point to um, come back on something said by Miss Kavanagh yesterday. Um, it seemed at some point that there was a suggestion that if accommodation is being used to deprive a child of liberty, it somehow comes outside of the Section 22C um, list or the 22C6 list because it somehow secure accommodation. Um, I have three very short responses to that. First, you have my point on statutory construction, that as a matter of domestic law, Section 22C is a closed list. They are the only permissible placements for a looked-after child, subject to the Human Rights Act point. 
Second, secure accommodation is a subset of that closed list. If accommodation satisfies the definition of secure accommodation, then there are additional requirements it's set out in section 25 that need to be met before a child can be placed there, including that if it's a registered ch if it's a children's home, it's been approved by the Secretary of State, that the court orders it, and that it meets the criteria in section 25.1. But, but they're additional, they're not alternatives. It still has to be one of the placements in 2266 in the first place. And third, and this is the point I think Mr. Orbin made, it appeared to, Ms. Kavanagh appeared to suggest that the placement for this child was secure accommodation. Um, it, it was never put that way before Mr. Justice MacDonald. Um, if it had been, Mr. Justice MacDonald would have had to determine whether it was secure accommodation. And then if it was, he would have to have applied the Section 25 criteria. He didn't do that. And we say that's because applying the definition of Lady Black in re is plainly not secure accommodation. It's not designed as secure accommodation because it's not a secure children's home approved by the Secretary of State. And for the reasons set out by Lady Black in paragraph 138 of re it's not accommodation that has as its primary purpose the restriction of liberty. Primary purpose is to provide care and support to this very vulnerable child and to keep her safe. And Lady Black says at paragraph 138, that's not secure accommodation. Yes. <clears throat> my Lord, if I might just turn my back for a moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my Lord, unless the court has any further questions, th those are my submissions. Thank you, Ms. Clement. We have no questions. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Roach. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, frankly, my lord, I don't think I can improve on the erudite submissions of my learned friends for the respondents, but I would like just to say a little bit more about the child who's at the centre of... I think that would be entirely right, yes. I'm grateful. I, I won't be long. I wish to update the court on some current circumstances. <clears throat> um, it is hoped, it's still hoped, that the child, I'll call her CK, has turned a corner. She's been in unreg an unregistered children's home since the end of August, and she remains there. Now, the location of the home allows her to have frequent contact with important members of her family and with friends, not far from where she grew up, has grown up. For the first time, she is cooperating with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. She was refusing to do that in previous accommodation. There is education in place. Someone, a teacher, goes to the placement to deliver education each week. And again, another change is she is communicating with the children's guardian who's been in and out of her life according to whether there is a live court application. And she is communicating with her solicitor. <coughs> Her self-harming and her absconding has reduced. It is not, it has not disappeared. There, we were told, or I was told, shortly before coming into court today, there had been an incident a couple of days ago. We're investigating that. And that get, one has to be careful what weight to put on this. But it appears that there was an incident of self-harm, not too serious, um, perhaps resulting from a change in the staffing arrangements in the home. I understand, from what I've been told by my learner junior, that a different a team is now in place, and this may have unsettled the child CK. And she presumably knows about this appeal, so my voice has gone now. <clears throat> I think she does. We've certainly um, been keeping her updated in yeah. relation to the proceedings before yeah. Mr Justice MacDonald. And it's not, um, not fanciful to think that knowing that the appeal is taking place might also be um, destabilising for her. Maybe I, 
I'm very cautious about what I say. She's been yes. told precisely about the dating of that, so um, I'm hesitant sort of immediately to agree with my lord. The process of registering appears to be quite a struggle for the placement provider. And as far as I understand it, there still isn't a completed application for registration. The home needs planning permission. And according to the last statement from the local authority, there was a mistake in the application for planning permission, an application for permission under the wrong category. So a new application is being made and an appeal against the refusal under the original application made a few months ago. The provider has been also waiting to recruit the manager before completing the application. And we were told that someone was interviewed two days ago. I don't know the results of that uh, interview, whether it was successful. Within the proceedings before Mr Justice MacDonald, the local authority is due to file a statement this coming Friday. At the hearing on the 18th of October, so part two, as it were, of these proceedings, we were told by my London friend, uh, acting for Ofsted, that there was no, in fact, no need to wait to have a longer term manager in place. One could make the application and um, insert the manager, as it were, while the application was ongoing and before a final decision was made. Well, it would make, and the, the time scale in the President's guidance in, envisages a much quicker process, and um, uh, waiting for that sort of step to be taken just would be not compatible with the, yes, uh, the I'm swift a, process. I'm afraid that then the, the local representative of Ofsted, who is liaising with the local authority, has discouraged the local authority from making the application before a manager is in place. So there are slightly different messages being delivered from uh, different parts of the organization. My learned friend would well, say I, that- I, my, my recollection of the detail of the guidance uh, and indeed the discussions I had with Ofsted before we, we finalized it was that, that there's obviously a difference between getting the application in and then it being determined, and there's a yes. process that takes some weeks, yes, and it yes. might be within that process that Ofsted would want to, to know or not know what's happening with the manager. But um, the message from the guidance is to get the application in. Because then, and then, then you work you start. work with any minutiae or yes. important that there may be uh, details uh, as you proceed. Yes, but mm -hmm. I think there are some practical obstacles to that because one makes the application uh, by computer. And it's difficult to get to the end stage of completing your application, and that being acknowledged by Ofsted, without going through that management page. I think that's a question of the way the right. software is well, built. Well, we're not going to resolve no. that now, but it's, um, it's helpful, at least for Ms. Clement and her team, to hear this, because it's um, the more we can do to um, <coughs> smooth out these um, misunderstandings one way or the other as to what's needed and um, to make the passage of the application yes. uh, as easy as possible, the, um, the, the goal of the guidance is more likely to be achieved. Yes. I mean, you'll appreciate that I'm simply repeating what we've been told by the local authority. I'm not at all shooting the, the messenger, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Roach. You shouldn't have to wear a, fl right. to wear a flag <laughs> <jacket. laughs> So, yes, yeah, slightly <laughs> conflicting advice from different parts yeah. of the organisation. If this home is never registered, it's likely that uh, CK will have to move a long way from her the locality. Area. Because no alternative has been found in the local area for her. The local authority has identified a new, potential new placement in a home which is being um, arranged at the moment in one of the northern counties, if I can put it that way. So quite a long way away from where she's grown up, and where her family lives. That home is waiting to be registered. The provider appears to be a little more experienced than the provider of the current placement, 
and appears to be further along in the process. And the last we were told was that that home might be available in early January. She simply won't have the same level of contact with her family if she moves to that other, that registered children's home. And she would have to start to build a new relationship with the local mental health team and with the local teaching resources. And obviously the Guardian's concern is that that might put in jeopardy the progress which she appears to have been making. She has already in her young life sort of suffered from the lack of resources because in May of last year, the only secure placement available for her, the one she went to, was many hundreds or several hundreds of miles away in Scotland. And she had very limited contact with her family and friends uh, in that placement. I think her mother was able to, I don't know all the reasons, but in fact went to see her once in the 15 months that she was there. And uh, it's believed that her stepfather and grandmother visited a similar number of times. She was very isolated, in other words, and she was saying at the end of that placement, which had not been successful by any benchmark, that she wanted to go nearer home yes. and she wanted to be uh, near her friends and family. We've also been told in the last statement from the local authority that she is still on the secure bed waiting list whether or not that remains appropriate for her. On the 1st of November, there were 54 uh, live referrals to that secure bed waiting list. And there were three beds which were shortly becoming available. All That's those 54, 54 nation nationwide. nationwide. Yeah. And the total number of beds, I think the last time I asked this question was about 200 out of something. Sorry, I, I'm not aware of... In the whole country? So if that's the case, then a quarter of 54, yes, can be help. That's when that half the beds are, re are retained for use in the criminal jurisdiction. Yes. Of the three beds which were shortly becoming available on the 1st of November, two of them were reserved for male children. So only one could have possibly have been uh, available. 200 odd yes. figure I was given was for those that are available in the welfare jurisdiction. Not, didn't include those available. Oh, I see. Thank you. But from what you say about um, the current placement and how uh, it is allowing uh, this young person to turn a corner, um, on the old adage, if it ain't broken, don't mend it, the idea of moving her to somewhere else, even though it's a registered secure unit, would not necessarily be the best thing for her. Now. Yes. yes, indeed. Yes. Clearly, what we want is that this home registered. is registered yes. as soon as possible because we fully understand all the advantages of having yes. a home which is registered and inspected and which complies with the yes. minimum standard. And it's not, it's not a case where they can't or won't mm. uh, try it, no. or there'll be it's a bit of a struggle. That's exactly indeed. the point I was going to make. Is it, it's frustrating yeah. to find a provider who has got no problem becoming registered as a principal, but is having a problem becoming registered. Yes. <clears throat> um, another point, which uh, maybe my final point on that, which um, Ofsted have pointed out to the local authorities, they recognise there is a shortage of managers available. So it's not just shortages of the right. physical accommodation, but a shortage of people mm. coming forward to... But it's very it. specialist work and, and frankly you've got to have a vocation to take on this sort of task because it is very difficult. Yes, yes, and stressful. And stressful. Yeah. Yes, I don't know what they're paid either but uh, mm. probably not a great deal if it's consistent mm. with other people working. In is there a shortage of staff within these, uh, I imagine within this establishment there is a shortage of staff as well? Well, I can't give you... Um, all I can say is that um, in late August, the local authority was able to staff the emergency placement quickly, albeit the staff were not provided by the placement provider. So you had a sort of complicated situation where one organisation 
was providing the building, and another organisation was providing the staff team. Um, obviously, which uh, potentially offers opportunities for miscommunication. But, uh, I believe, in fact, now perhaps the accommodation provider is providing the staff, and that was the change the other day. My mistake, it's yet another agency. staff agency providing the staff, not the accommodation provider. I understand what I've just been yeah. told by my learned friend. So I hope that's helpful uh, to the court. It's less erudite, but uh, it's important. It, it's certainly important and it is helpful. Um, I want to say something, but anything I about to say on this theme is going to sound patronising, and that's the last thing any one of the three of us would want me to be sounding. Uh, it is uh, uh, the case that we've spent two days not mentioning CK uh, and involving ourselves in these interesting points of law. But the whole case is about CK. The, all these cases come before the court, and it's impossible as a human being, whether you're a judge or whoever you are, to read about CK's life and her experience and the difficulties that she has with her, her life at the moment and not feel the keenest concern for her. And that's, that's what all the cases are about. They're tied up in law because, for good reasons, Parliament has enacted a statutory scheme which clearly sets out these various categories and the supervision um, arrangements and the rest. But there are young people who have acute needs and who are very vulnerable and the court and indeed the agencies are trying to within the law in the widest sense um, meet those needs uh, and it's complicated and so therefore we have to indulge in the, the law but it's uh, impossible to come to this case and not feel the greatest concern uh, for CK but also um, feel the germs of hope in what you have described in terms of her current experience and her ability to begin to engage with the sorts of support that may help her turn, continue to turn the corner. Uh, and it is clearly, um, no one would have a different view in this room, clearly beneficial as it's turning out to be for her to be in her own familiar locality so that she can engage with folks she knows, places she knows, and most importantly, if she wishes to, the family members that she is seeing at the, at the moment. So I hope that message in some way can be communicated from so the, the three of us to, to, to her. And, and perhaps it's mm. an example where the inherent jurisdiction is genuinely benefiting mm. my client. The mm. flexibility and the ability of the jurisdiction to mm. meet the needs where a more inflexible view of the statute yes. just can't do that. Yes. Thank yeah. you, my lord, my lady. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well, I'd very briefly give you a point of a factual point on a note that's been handed up to me. I'm not entirely sure who from behind me, maybe off dead. Um, 200 beds were mentioned. Now, thank you. Thank you. 200 beds were mentioned. Um, the 200 beds are justice and welfare, which I think is one yes, of right. yeah. And of those, about 130 are welfare beds. Right. That's 200 altogether? Yes. 200, 200 are justice and welfare, and of those, right. 130 welfare. Uh, may I, I've just pulled up, uh, as we did in the previous cases, Read B and Read T, for the Association of Lawyers for Children, the statistics published yes. by the government on the 31st of March 2021, uh, sorry, of every year, to which my Lord, mm. Lord Justice Baker was referring uh, when he said he had those before him. Um, they, they do give slightly different figures, but perhaps if we send these in in a note of what we've got, so you have the whole picture. But it does look a little worse than that for this reason. Though they say that there are technically 253 approved beds as of the 31st of March 2021, 107 of those are commissioned by the Ministry of Justice, the Youth Justice. So that would leave 146 welfare. But what the statistics seem to show, and there is no real explanation for this, is that as of that date, only 142 children across both the criminal, the youth justice and the welfare beds were accommodated. That rather suggests that the beds are not being used to their full capacity. 
particularly in circumstances of the information we've just been given that, that there are 50 school children. Well, on the <coughs> this jogs my memory that the similar statistics were given yeah. to us in re T two or three years ago, and um, I was concerned because it doesn't that doesn't fit with the picture that the courts are being told about week in, week out. <clears throat> and I was also concerned that the reports such as that, if seen uh, by members of parliament and others, they would think, well, there's no problem yeah. here. We don't need more beds. They're not even using the beds we've got. And so um, I think I may have said something to that effect in the judgment in re T, not perhaps as bluntly as, as that. I, but um, <clears throat> Lord did say something in re T, and I, yes. and I quoted what the ALC said in re B, and there is a B96, and, and it sounds like the figures have got worse, Miss Cavan. From what I was told by the AL, we were, the court was told by the ALC in re in re B, yeah, a couple of years ago. Is that right? It's the way they the way they count them. There's some <clears throat> there's some difference in the way that they're counted from um, that the somehow misses out the reality. But well, my little uh, the president's point that um, it's in fact stated expressly in the summary when publishing these statistics that the availability of proved placements has dropped slightly to 88%, down four places to two, two, three. But they talk about the capacity being um, effectively not taken up, that, it's, it's, uh, that um, within the 14 secure children's homes, there were 142 children accommodated, down 23% on last year, representing 42 fewer children. This is an occupancy rate of 56 percent, the lowest recorded in the time period from 2010. This follows a rise of seven percent in the number of children accommodated. Well, in well we're not. I think in this appeal, we're probably not going to no, no. need to be involved in that sort of um, issue. At all. I, I can. I can. We, the offer is there to provide more information if the court would be assisted, and we can explain why, for example, there are some situations where you have. A, a, a locality where there's one child and there can't be other children in that at the same time. But it, it, well, if uh, it, if you want, we can. If we, my lord and my lady and I will discuss it. And it, it's certainly a matter that those behind you can take this back. That I would welcome discussing with the minister for children, and that's probably the better forum in which um, to sit down, roll sleeves up, and look at the look at the report and look at the way the the thing is counted. But um, that will be my lord's point about there being. Oh, Genuine understanding about what's happening on the ground is really is is really important. If, 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 if there must be a misconception, ask anybody, ministers, anybody, public, about the about the headline number of places. If a proportion of them are just not available mm. for whatever reason, and I'm sure there are good reasons why they're not available. But um, the statistic Mr. Roach gave is the one that typically the courts are given. That there's a the list of and each one of the fifty four or whatever the figure was. Is, Highly vulnerable and needy young person, and um, that just just doesn't sit alongside the statistics Miss Cavan has quoted. There will be some young people in some of the cases that come before the High Court currently who, for whom a secure accommodation unit would not be appropriate. Their needs are different, um, but they may need to have their liberty restricted for, for other reasons. Now, Miss Cavan. On reflection, did you wish to address us upon the point that Mr. Spencer raised with you? No, we, we've reflected overnight. I'm grateful for the opportunity, but I don't wish to add anything. No, thank you. So, Mr. Drabble, we're in your your hands in terms of um, uh, response to the submissions that have been made. Would you? I, I don't know how long you think you might be. We'd be prepared without having checked at all with <laughs> my lord or my lady, but with the arrogance which comes for sitting in this chair, <laughs> we, we'd be prepared to sit on a little bit beyond the, or, the ordinary um, finishing time if, if that would allow you to conclude your submissions. Alternatively, you may wish... I'm reluctant to undertake to do it in quarter of an hour, which is a no. way of... No, well, I think it'd be better to... Is putting to well, shall we, shall we rise I'm now? I'm my toe in the water, but, or, but equally it may be more sensible to start at whatever time your Lordship uh, court chooses. And we're to start at 10 to 2. Shall we start at 10 to 2? Yes, I'm going to. If that's, um, that will be convenient. Good. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, right.